those who are not from our country. Uh, if Dr. Sridhar is ready, I would just like to introduce him and um, we can then start. So Dr. Um, Dr. Sridhar is, um, is a consultant neonatologist uh, in Banat al Emirat Hospital. Uh, he has completed his basic studies from Stanley Medical College, Chennai, India, and then went on to do MD in pediatrics and DM neonatology from very reputed institutes in India, Jipmer, Pondicherry, and PGI-MER, Chandigarh. He then went on to become a fellow of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health in 2006 and is a national member of, uh, is a member of the National Neonatology Forum India. He's also an examiner for the member of Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health Examination, and he has more than 26 years of experience combined in India, UK, and the UAE, and has a special interest in neonatal ventilation, neurodevelopment, um, and, and other pediatric and neonatology concerns. Uh, interestingly, he also um, runs a, a YouTube channel, and uh, which has a lot of information, not just for doctors and physicians and nurses, but also for parents. So we will be posting a link of that in the chat box. If you are interested, then you can make a note of that and, um, and, and you know, go and see it and, and enjoy it and learn from it. Uh, so I hand over now to Dr. Sridhar um, for taking this very important topic of neonatal screening um, and, and over Good to you. Good morning, everyone. And I hope uh, all of you can see me. Uh, can you see me? And I'll just start yes, sharing yes, the screen. Absolutely. Uh, I should uh, commend uh, Dr. Neha and team for this uh, great job they are doing in uh, the CME sessions uh, on a regular basis. So, so useful to everyone and also CME accredited, which makes it uh, very helpful. Is there any option that we can enable uh, automatic admission because the messages keep popping up for people to be admitted in? We keep admitting them so they don't bother you. <laughs> Try to no. keep on top of it. Okay. So, uh, I have started screen sharing. Can you see my first screen, first slide? I think you're muted. Uh, can you see me? Screen. Yes, yes, Dr. Sridhar. Okay. So uh, as you rightly said, I mean, this is a very basic but very important topic. I'll try to uh, keep it uh, as simple as possible uh, because I know the audience is not just pediatricians and neonatologists. And that's why I chose a topic which is relevant to everyone. And in terms of uh, question and answers, obviously, feel free to ask anything related to normal newborn care. I mean, does it need to be restricted to this topic? The learning objectives was presented. You see that you've gotten mute, yeah. yeah. Someone uh, muted me by mistake. That's fine. So the uh, we need to understand why we need uh, screening for diseases in the neonates. Uh, the newborn period is a critically important period because everything we do is literally like a screening. Anything we do to support, anything that goes wrong has an impact on the long-term health as well. So you can say that even though screening is defined by certain tests, I mean, we have the newborn blood spot testing, newborn hearing screen, hip dysplasia screen, and critical heart disease screen. These are the main parameters which we lay, label as screening, but the careful clinical assessment, the support we give the mother to breastfeed, the monitoring for jaundice, the monitoring for hypoglycemia, the monitoring for risk of infection, everything comes into the domain of screening because it's something where you can look for something which can impact on the future outcome. So, we will start with the risk factors uh, because picking up the risk factors is part of the uh, screening aspect. So we have a group B streptococcal screening in the mother to prevent the risk of uh, early onset group B streptococcal infection. The swab is usually done at 35 to 36 weeks. The obstetrician reviews the result and the impact of that will be whether we treat the mother with antibiotics. So nearly 20 to 25% of the mothers have GBS and so a reasonable number of mothers end up being on antibiotics. And if the mother doesn't receive antibiotics, we treat the baby differently, close and monitoring in a term baby, in a premature baby when we need infection screening as well. We have uh, clear guidelines to support this. The maternal screening that is done antenatally, like hepatitis B uh, screening, for example, if the mother is hepatitis B positive, the baby will need hepatitis B immunoglobulin as well as vaccine at birth. So that's very important result to look at. HIV obviously is not very common here because of the visa regulations, but 
picking up HIV in the mother is very important to prevent uh, screening, I mean, prevent uh, uh, transmission risk. I think uh, someone is muting me repeatedly. Please uh, <laughs> note that uh, part. The antenatal maternal screening uh, includes uh, growth scanning as well. So we have to be very uh, looking at the growth parameters. If the baby has abnormal growth, that needs to be looked at. The scan results, including the anomaly screen, uh, very important to look at. If there are any problems that can be picked up, they may suggest uh, abnormalities in the baby that may need intervention after birth. Parents have to be involved at all stages so they know what's the likely uh, impact of each one. Many times these are uh, transient changes. You don't need to worry them too much. So uh, like single umbilical artery, for example, if the rest of the screening is normal, it doesn't impact uh, on the future health. The growth monitoring and subsequent monitoring is enough. So reassurance is important. Echogenic bubble is fairly frequent. Many times it's a result of a little swallowed blood and which becomes echogenic, but we do need to look at the scan carefully, not other abnormalities. Diabetes status of the mother is important for different reasons. One is to monitor the control. And of course, uh, the better the control, the less impact on the baby. And of course, the risk factor for hypoglycemia is there. So that's another factor that we'll be looking at. And the growth monitoring goes with the scan monitoring as well. So the intrauterine growth is very important to follow up. In the newborn period, again, we look at the risk of sepsis. So the early onset sepsis calculator is used in our hospital and in many centers in UAE. And uh, obviously, the group e streptococcal screening result is one of the parameters. If the mother has uh, PPROM, if the mother has other factors uh, with the risk of infection, like fever or risk of chorioaminitis, if the baby is symptomatic, all these will uh, escalate the score. And we have uh, certain categories where we have to investigate and monitor certain categories where you have to start antibiotics as well. And we have the risk factors for blood glucose monitoring, uh, which is very important uh, to look at. We'll be looking at those as well and any other factors that would warrant close monitoring. So communication with the family is important here because many times we assume that uh, the information comes from the obstetric team to us, but sometimes it doesn't happen, especially if it's a community-based obstetrician or the mother is not booked in your hospital and we shouldn't assume that the parents would always uh, raise a question so, so for example even critical heart diseases like uh, chorioactation which were diagnosed antenatally the parents didn't mention anything and sometimes you may miss uh, picking up in the postnatal period so ask that open question was there anything discussed in your pregnancy that was of concern so that would help us at least add another checkbox you know the Swiss cheese pattern for errors, so we remove one more uh, room for the error there. The postnatal examination is very important. Again, uh, as I said, the first 24 to 36 hours is very critical for various aspects, and the earlier we pick up problems, the better. So the initial assessment after delivery is done by the nurse, midwife, or doctor attending the delivery. Depending on where you work, the setup may be different, but a careful examination is important for certain parts. So whether the oral cavity is normal, whether the eyes are normal, the limbs are normal, the anal opening, it's very important to stretch the buttocks and make sure that the anal opening is seen clearly. There is nothing abnormal in the genital area because these are things which have importance on the health of the baby. Um, before discharge, of course, all the babies will have a full examination by the pediatrician and that should include uh, the head, face and mouth, cardiovascular system assessment, Red reflex is important and the hips as well. It's, uh, these two are taken as uh, screening measures as well. So uh, it's very important that we document clearly all that is done because they can come back and bite you. Again, uh, palate examination, I mean, we shouldn't take it lightly as well. I mean, when you examine the oral cavity, make sure the mouth is well open. If you can't see the full palate, use a tongue depressor or use your uh, gloved digits to feel. Uh, look for features which may affect the feeding as well because support for the feeding is very important to prevent certain problems later on. Just a quick mention of red reflex. It's a very simple test which can be done by anyone who is basically trained and you need an ophthalmoscope. You may need to darken the room in uh, especially the dark colored babies. The fair babies, usually the pupils are well dilated anyway and uh, it can be easily seen. And you just need to keep it and you may adjust the uh, power uh, according to the baby and your correction. So usually plus two or three is a reasonable measure, but you can adjust it to improve the clarity. You're not looking at the fundus. You're only looking for a flash of red when you look through the pupils and you normally keep it around a foot away uh, from the baby, about 20 to 30 centimeters. 
you hold the baby and the same examiner holding the eyelids apart when you're checking helps the coordination. It also reduces undue disturbance of the baby because uh, you, over time you would learn how to be gentle and the baby doesn't cry when you're handling. And because if the baby starts crying, the eye starts shutting tighter, you need to do it early on in your uh, examination system. If the baby is sleeping, again, a gentle uh, movement of the eyes is enough to open it. If the baby is uh, not settling down, folding and rocking, the baby tends, uh, they open the eyes spontaneously and you have to be alert and catch it then. So we are mainly doing it to make sure the pathway of light is clear. If uh, you see the red reflex, it means it's normal. But if uh, you don't see the red reflex and it looks white, you need to refer to the ophthalmologist because you may have problems like congenital cataract, you may have uh, hyperplastic vitreous and uh, other underlying problems. Of course, uh, it's not a bad idea to look at it quickly, even in the future visits, because problems like retinoblastoma, even though we are very rare, I mean, uh, it may be picked up. Another common concern in the newborn babies is a subconjunctival hemorrhage, which is benign due to the pressure and congestion around the time of delivery. And this doesn't need referral to the ophthalmologist unless it's pretty extensive. I mentioned already about uh, cardiovascular system that we feel the I mean, femoral pulses, especially in the first 24 hours, you may continue to feel it even if there is a problem like coarctation because the patent ductus is still open in many of these babies. So it doesn't rule out and the critical heart disease screen adds on to this process as well uh, to make sure that we don't miss out heart disease. So you examine the baby thoroughly initially, but again, before discharge, make sure you feel the femoral pulse and the saturation, the critical heart disease screening is done as close to discharge as possible because the later in time, the better. So just a quick mention of the critical congenital heart disease screen is also called the oxygen saturation screen. It's one of the recent uh, developments about 10 to 15 years. It has been rising a lot and almost five years when it became mandatory in most of the countries. It's very easy to do because everyone has a pulse oximeter. The only cost is that of the nursing time and uh, clear documentation and having a system to record it is very important. So uh, you can say this has been in evolution for 15 years and is well established for five to seven years now. And you perform close to 24 hours of age and earlier if the discharging is uh, happening early. But in that case, bring them to the clinic earlier and you may need to repeat it again during the clinic visit as well. Uh, you do it typically in the right hand, which is the pre-ductal blood flow. You know that the ductus arteriosus joins uh, just before the uh, left subclavian. And so the blood flow before that is pre-ductal and the blood flow after that is post-ductal. So the left upper limb may or may not be pre-ductal. So we usually consider it as post-ductal. And then you look at either foot for post-ductal. Baby should be awake, but not struggling and have regular breathing. We record the saturation for at least two minutes. And we should remember that it's only to pick up the critical heart disease. It doesn't pick up a left to right shunt like a VSD, ASD, PDF, for example. So the saturation is not going to drop in those babies. And even the shunt becomes more only over the first few weeks as the pulmonary flow. Uh, changes or reduces, the uh, resistance reduces. So we have conditions like hypoplastic left heart, tricuspid or pulmonary atresia, tetralogy of fallow, transposition of great arteries, TAPVZ, and of course the severe coarctation would have borderline saturation in these cases. One of the additional benefits of doing this is sometimes uh, you have suboptimal uh, lung adaptation, and even though the baby is not clinically distressed, you may pick up uh, the problem by using this uh, system. And it may just mean that the baby needs a little more time to transition and it is safer than when the baby is in the NICU. So it not only picks up heart disease, it also helps us diagnose other concerns. Uh, about 20% uh, additional uh, diagnosis can be picked up. Uh, this is just a chart to illustrate the same point. Uh, so the criteria for pass or fail, if it is less than 90% uh, in either of the limbs, it's a definite fail. So you would need to refer on what you do. Uh, after you fail depends on your setup. So you may call the cardiologist directly or if the neonatologist does a screening echo and involves a cardiologist uh, when they're available, that's fine as well. But a uh, baby would need careful evaluation. You would normally do a chest X-ray as, uh, as well in these babies. When the saturation is between 90 to 95% and uh, there is a more than 3% difference, you repeat the screen in one hour. And if it fails again, you can repeat one more time. Uh, if it fails again, then it's considered a positive screen. And if it is more than 95% and the difference between the pre and post is less than 3%, uh, 
then it's a pass and you don't need to do anything more. Of course, it doesn't mean that you don't uh, consider any concerns. If the baby deteriorates, uh, pass, I mean, the baby passing the initial screen doesn't rule out problems and you still have to start with bigger in a symptomatic baby. In terms of the respiratory system, I mean, uh, we might have antenatal concerns which were highlighted and uh, congenital anomalies may be there. But apart from that, it's mainly the well-being of the baby that is looked at. Uh, one of the main problems that may be missed out is uh, coronal atresia, which is unilateral bilateral coronal atresia presence with the baby getting dusky when baby is quiet, but when the baby cries, the baby's color improves. And uh, obviously, unilateral may be presenting later on because it's just uh, the baby can cope with unilateral obstruction, but it may come with the distress or uh, noisy breathing and so on. And examination of the abdomen mainly for organomegaly, and you may have antenatal scan concerns like renal. Uh, I mean, hydronephrosis and so on, which uh, we have protocols to monitor. The genital examination is very important. And in a male, it's very important not to miss undescended testis. I mean, this is one of the areas which come back with complaints where the doctor misses it, then a grandmother picks it up at home, and then they come back. Uh, you know the pathway of testicular descent. So uh, it starts in the uh, perinephric area and then it descends down the gubernaculum testis brings it down and through the inguinal canal in a premature baby it's already in this path of descent so when a baby is born at 33 34 weeks often you get it in the inguinal canal and by the time they reach term it descends down if it is twin pregnancies you may have disparity between the twins twins in the rate of descent as well so you may have to reassure the parents that only monitoring is needed if the undescended testis is bilateral and uh, the phallus is small then you have to look at the virilization pathway because a bilateral undescended testis and uh, abnormal phallus could indicate a virilized female baby, which would point to more serious concerns like congenital adrenal hyperplasia. So this is the uh, pathway between the uh, female genitals and the male genitals, how the testosterone related uh, as aspects change the uh, approach and you get anomalies in the way like uh, you may get a significant hypospadias, for example, which is part of the uh, under-viralization of the male problem. Micropenis is another genital problem which can point to other problems like hypopituitarism. The stretched penis length uh, should be measured carefully and if it is less than 2.5 centimeter, it's an area of concern, especially if the baby has other features like uh, poor feeding or hypoglycemia or persistent jaundice. You have to work up in uh, rule out endocrine problems. Hypo Pituitarism can present uh, mainly with this, and we have to refer to the endocrinologist in these cases. Developmental dysplasia of the hip is a very tricky problem because as the word indicates, it's a developmental problem. Previously, we used to call it congenital uh, hip dysplasia or CDH, and that was changed to developmental mainly to clarify this part that what is present at birth is not necessarily what you get later. So the problem need not be fully evolved at birth and it may de uh, develop to a hip dysplasia even if your initial examination is normal. So this is a protective mechanism, So, but it doesn't make, uh, make us any less responsible for not screening well initially. So make sure the parents are aware that you're examining the hips when you examine, document it clearly as to what test you have done and whether it is uh, pass, or pass or not, and also document if there are any risk factors. So. There are two approaches. One is we refer if there is a risk uh, factor or in some Western countries like Germany and Scandinavian countries, they screen all the newborns for hip dysplasia. So obviously uh, screening all newborns is going to be a fail-proof method. But if you are using the risk factor method, we should be alert in the follow-up as well, not to miss out problems. So we refer if there is a risk like breach presentation, uh, especially a female baby has a higher risk as well family history where a first degree relative uh, has a developmental dysplasia of the hip. Uh, abnormal clinical examination, of course, uh, Barlow's and Ortolani test where Barlow's dislocates and Ortolani reduces. It's very important that uh, we, uh, we, we are clear about a clicky hip. I mean, many babies have a clicky hip after birth because the progesterone which relaxes the mother's pelvic uh, ligaments also relaxes the baby's own. So if it is only a click and Barlow's and Ortolani are negative, uh, you can uh, repeat it after a week when, you, when they come for the follow-up. And if it's persistent click, then you have to refer them. So uh, this is just to illustrate what Barlow's is. And as I said, uh, 
Barlow's, we can remember it as OR for Ortolani reduces and BD for Barlow's dislocates. So in Barlow's, you are going to adduct the hip and push back when the head of the femur will come out with a clunk. And Ortolani, you are abducting the hip and you are pushing up on the uh, ischial tuberosity region. So the uh, greater trochanter will reduce back, the head of femur will reduce back. In a well-established uh, hip dislocation, you may have a shortening of that site. You may have abnormal creases, but these are signs which appear later. And don't keep repeating this test, uh, especially we have residents at Radies and one or two of them may examine, but repeated examination will uh, affect the labrum, the acetabular uh, labrum, and uh, it's not good for the baby. It's also painful. So unfortunately, because it's one in 1,000 or so, a trainee may not see that many cases, but we have to be restricting the number of times we do this test. The newborn early warning score is a system uh, similar to, I mean, it's well established as well in many places with the uh, obstetric uh, risk factor score, the pediatric early warning score. And uh, this is just a system to alert everyone to pick up problems early. So it's a form of screening, you can say. And the temperature, uh, respiration, grunting, heart rate, color, neurology, these are all reviewed and you have uh, ranges of normal for each and ranges when you start getting concerned about them and ranges where it is definitely abnormal. So you can have your own classification according to your system, who will review what they will do when there is a two amber score, then it needs an early review. One red should be almost immediate escalation. And uh, these are good quality improvement projects where you can easily observe what is done if there is a red score, how quickly do we assess and so on. In a hospital like ours where we have a rapid response team, obviously uh, we should be able to respond fairly quickly. The newborn hearing screen is other important screen uh, that is done in all babies. So it's called a universal hearing screen. And uh, most typically it's autoacoustic emissions that is tested, but some centers may directly go for the ABR according to their uh, facility and availability. Autoacoustic emission is basically sound which is given off by the inner ear when the cochlea is stimulated by a sound. So there is a uh, headphone which is attached to the baby and this clicking sound is emitted and a receptor, the sensor picks up the uh, returning sound waves. So the sound stimulates the cochlea there is an electrical response and the outer hair cells vibrate. And this vibration produces a nearly inaudible sound that echoes back into the middle ear. And this can be measured with a small probe. So if the hearing loss is more than 25 to 30 decibels, there is no autoacoustic emission detected. And uh, you can have negative results in the immediate newborn period due to uh, blockage in the outer ear canal. There may be presence of middle ear fluid or damage to the outer hair cells in the cochlea. So uh, a fail is seen in about 10% of the babies in the immediate newborn period, but when you repeat it after seven to 10 days in most of them, it passes. So many times we get asked, why don't you directly do the test at seven to 10 days? That's because you want to keep the universal nature of the screen. Once they go home, many times the compliance rate for the follow-up drops. They may go to other centers, so you may miss out. And when we do the test, and even though the, it's a false positive and we repeat it and then it becomes negative, it alerts the parents that uh, there could be a possible problem. So we tend to do it uh, when they are in the hospital to avoid missing out. Uh, of course, if they fail, we don't need to overly make the parents anxious, but we need to stress the importance of coming back. And uh, the goal is to pick up any deafness which is significant before three months of age and start appropriate intervention with the pediatric ENT and audiology team before six months of age. So we do have time in a premature baby, for example, we do it at the time of discharge. There are babies who have risk factors like family history of deafness, uh, use of antibiotics, especially aminoglycosides for longer duration. Uh, the risk of hearing loss due to aminoglycosides is partly because of the genetic predisposition. So even if you give one dose, uh, the risk is there. But at the same time, as responsible pediatricians, uh, we need to restrict the use of aminoglycoside duration. If the culture comes back, you can stop it as early as possible. So uh, the baby has to be calm during the autoacoustic emission. So many times audiologist prefers the baby to be sleeping, um, but you can do it in a quite awake baby as well. The most important part, what we call as newborn screening is obviously the process of testing newborn babies with the blood spot screening. This is the most uh, 
I mean, a well established screening tool in newborns. So, uh, we test for genetic, endocrinologic, metabolic, and hematologic diseases which are amenable to screen. So, there are certain criteria that need to be met. So, like for example, the test should be specific enough. Uh, you should have a confirmatory test to do after the screening comes back. It should be reasonably cost effective. And uh, there should be some form of uh, management approach. I mean, it may or may not be a direct treatment, but it may be change of milk, for example, in terms of metabolic disorders. Uh, thyroid, for example, you need to start the treatment at the earliest and we have a proper treatment for it. And early timely detection should make a difference. So that is another uh, factor to be considered in a screening test. There is a lot of research which has been done on choosing these screening tests and different uh, zones of the world have different tests which are uh, unique to them. So you may find even in the same region, different tests being added in certain centers. Cost plays a role as well in the choice of the lab uh, who is doing the tests. For example, for galactosemia, the more sensitive test is the enzyme test, but some labs may do the cheaper galactose test, which is not that sensitive. So uh, obviously when we choose the lab doing it and the cost you have to compare like for like. And it's a battery of tests which are performed on filter paper spots. One interesting fact is that uh, it's done as a pooled sample. So, I mean, that's why the labs are able to do so many tests cheaper. So they run a lot of uh, say 100 samples at one time. And if anything triggers as abnormal, they repeat uh, all those uh, 100 spots one by one. This doesn't happen frequently. Suppose one to 2% of the spots are abnormal, then uh, the lab uh, doesn't need to repeat too many of these uh, samples. The labs also are very clear in what cutoff will trigger as an abnormal result. And we have to be sure that it's appropriate, especially for conditions like uh, hypothyroidism. It's usually done between two to five days in most units. Uh, previously, we used to say, don't do it before 48 hours because of the PSH surge. But with discharge practices becoming more and more early, we are doing it as early as 24 hours. And we don't see a significant change in the false positive rate, for example, for TSH, because the TSH cutoffs have also been adjusted according to the age of the baby. So uh, for example, the lab may use a cutoff of uh, 15 to 20 if they're doing it before 36 hours and adjust the uh, range to eight or uh, eight to 10 in the older babies. And we may need repeating in the premature babies and babies who are not on feed. So the NICUs have a policy that uh, they do a zero screen because many of these babies are sick. They may need a transfusion. They are not going to be fed for a few days. They're on TPN. And so once they stop the TPN, we uh, repeat the newborn screen. Many preterm babies have slightly abnormal results with 17 hydroxyprogesterone and this warrants a repeat screen as well. Uh, in a bigger baby, for example, if they're on feeds and uh, if you're going to transfuse them, it's better that we take a sample before the blood transfusion. We may need to repeat it after a few weeks if needed, but uh, after three to four weeks uh, is when we want to avoid after blood transfusion. So the most important tests that are included in this blood spot screening is TSH for congenital hypothyroidism, phenyl ketonuria, uh, galactosemia, I mean, of course, other amino acid disorders are included. Uh, cystic fibrosis, G6PD deficiency, 17 hydroxyprogesterone uh, for 21 hydroxylase, which is a type of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Hemoglobinopathies, I mean, if the test that is done is just gel electrophoresis, you will pick up on the sickle cell, uh, sickle cell trait and uh, alpha thalassemia, but beta thalassemia is not picked up on the newborn screen normally. And in populations like the local population where beta thalassemia risk is high, the locals may be offered a genetic screening for that as well. Uh, there is antenatal screening of the parents in these cases as well. Uh, one important uh, point to uh, mention here is that the urea cycle disorders are often not picked up in the newborn screen. So we should be alert to that. So we have other conditions like uh, medium chain acyl CoA dehydrogenase deficiencies, organic acidemias, amino acidopathies. These depend on the baby being fed. And that's why uh, very important that we have the baby on full feeds before we do it. And uh, because we are doing it by 24 hours when the milk hasn't come in much in a breastfed baby, that doesn't rule out. So if the baby comes back later and you have a concern, you can do the screening test. And uh, in uh, babies with suspected metabolic problems, you alert the lab so that they can process that sample at the earliest possible. So very important that we have a system to take the sample accurately. Many times the uh, lab trains our nursing staff 
on uh, taking the sample appropriately. The blotch should not be too big. It should be appropriately within the circle and all these spots should be filled. They don't process all these spots. They store a couple of them for future testing if needed. So many population-based studies which are devised can use the blood spot screening for future sampling tests as well. Even if they introduce newer screening tests, they can use the same samples to test for them. How long the lab will screen, store the test, that depends on the local uh, legal system. And we should have a clear uh, way of uh, getting the results back. So now we are getting uh, the reports back fairly quickly and we see it in the patient's file as well. And there is an alert coming from the lab if there is an abnormal result to the team concerned. So uh, we have in our team, for example, copied all the neonatal consultants and the charge nurses so that if one is on leave, the MRP is on leave, that is covered. So that is one of the main problems that happens sometimes that if you have just the reporting to the MRP and it's not a phone call, it's not a critical report, it may get delayed. And uh, the parent should be informed in a timely fashion in an appropriate way. It's very important that we don't scare them unnecessarily for something that just needs a repeat test. For example, the immune reactive trypsinogen may come back high, but in many cases, it's going to come down on its own. It's not really cystic fibrosis. So we just need to reassure them that it's a repeat test that is needed. But at the same time, we should tell them that the repeat is very important to do. And the good thing is that most of the labs do the repeat test uh, without charging. And there should be prompt action. Depending on the condition, the action should be very quick. In some cases, like galactosemia, when the result is categorically abnormal, uh, hypothyroidism is a critical result which should be acted immediately. Before 24 hours, we should be deciding on the treatment. And uh, the 17-hydroxyprogesterone is high in preterm babies due to the age-related changes. And again, we look at the numbers, whether it's very high or not too high, then we can reassure, but you look at the other parameters like the blood glucose, the sodium, and repeat it closer to term if the other parameters suggest it's due to prematurity. So don't repeat it too quickly when the baby is still premature. In terms of galactosemia, I mean, if you are doing the enzyme, you may pick up the Duart variants. So you may need caution with these, but often you continue breastfeeding and uh, the level, enzyme level is 10 to 25% of normal. These babies can uh, metabolize the lactose and uh, we shouldn't overdose it, and that's the only thing. If they need formula, we avoid uh, lactose-containing milk. We go for soya milk. But uh, if they are breastfeeding, we just monitor it and repeat the enzyme after two, three months and with the galactose level as well. Again, I warned you about galactose being used as a screening test. Many times it's not going to pick up early on, especially when the milk hasn't come in when you're doing the screening. So if you have concerns, you may need to repeat. And if you have an option of choosing the test, better to go for the enzyme test. Uh, hypoglycemia risk is, again, because of the risk of brain injury, if you don't pick up hypoglycemia, we have to balance because all the babies have a physiologic nadir uh, in the first uh, three to six hours of age. And the sugar may be low if you test it on all babies. Again, the feeding takes time to establish as well. So it's very important we don't do the blood sugar unnecessarily. So there are uh, defined risk factors. And these risk factors are based on either the baby having uh, inadequate stores in the body. So if they are not having enough milk, they cannot utilize the alternative fuel. Or there is a condition like hyperinsulinism, which blocks the uh, gluconeogenesis and similar pathways, uh, the alternative fuel utilization is uh, uh, not managed well. So we have risk factors like large for gestational age or small for gestational age babies, uh, infant of diabetic mother, the beta blockers in the mother is a risk factor, premature babies. Of course, any baby with symptoms, we have to look for the blood glucose as well. And it's very important that we act promptly to correct the hypoglycemia. Many times we try to feed them and correct it, but sometimes they need to come to the NICU for IV fluids. Jaundice is another uh, important factor uh, because the risk of uh, jaundice going to very high levels is a risk of permanent brain damage uh, due to bilirubin-induced neurological injury or bind. Uh, the severe form is called kernictress. It is preventable because we can easily screen for the risk factors and also screen the babies where the trend of jaundice would suggest whether it is going in the higher range. So we have to identify if the baby has risk factors for jaundice, the RH negative mother, mother who is O positive, babies AB or AB, uh, positive Coombs test, which is a direct antigen test, bruising, uh, cephalomatoma, which releases uh, more bilirubin, and so the risk of jaundice is aggravated. 
and term babies born less than 39 weeks and premature babies are at higher risk. This is related to the liver maturation being slower in these babies. So physiologic jaundice is where jaundice happens in almost all the babies. Um, the red cells are high in the fetal load because of the anaerobic, I mean, because of the hypoxic environment. And after birth, a lot of uh, breakdown of these red cells happens and the liver has to catch up with this bilirubin release from the red cell breakdown. So that's why the transitional or physiologic jaundice is normal. However, there are some situations as mentioned here, which can aggravate it. Breastfeeding by itself is a risk uh, because of the slow onset, but uh, I had recently shared antenatal expressing, which is a very important concept and about 36 weeks, mothers can start expressing antenatally that sensitizes them to the process and the stimulation makes sure that the milk is coming when the baby needs it. Because in a way, mother who is establishing lactation, it may take a uh, couple of days for the milk to come and this two days of low milk intake associated with the background reasons for the jaundice to increase may cause physiologic jaundice to aggravate. So by preempting, we can reduce the risk of this progressing. So uh, the screening is introduced and the guidelines and uh, we have to screen all the babies both for risk factors and we also do the transcutaneous bilirubin or TSB as needed. Early discharge increases the risk of kernicterus if adequate follow-up is not ensured and that's why the focus is on making sure everyone knows the risk and they are informed about that. And each unit, including ours, has clear-cut guidelines to ensure best practice in this field. So I know, uh, I mean, I've covered a lot, but they are very basic and I hope uh, you are able to uh, follow and we can have questions as well. Dr. Neha, I mean, do we have any questions? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So I'm just, uh, there are some hands which have been raised. Ramna Khatib, uh, your hand is raised. Would you like to ask a question? Who? Oh. Dr. Rana and Deepa. I'd like to ask a question, Deepa Jayan. Okay. Um, at the moment, there are not many questions about the lecture. Uh, I think it's more that people are more concerned about the certificates. We will explain about the certificates in a bit. Uh, there's a comment from Sarah, excellent presentation. And I think that that really was a very good overview. And as an uh, uh, obstetrician also, I think it's very important for us to know all this because a lot of the time before and after delivery, the parents discuss with us also about, you know, something that's running in the family and they want to make sure their previous baby had something like a D6PD deficiency or something, and they want to make sure that this baby has been screened and checked. So it's good to have an overview and like you said, not to scare the parents, but to, you know, reassure them sometimes and explain to them that this is what is being done. Dr. Iftihaj has a question. Uh, Dr. Iftihaj, go ahead, unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, thank you, doctor, for this is very informative, excellent presentation. Uh, actually, we gain a lot from it. So I have a question regarding uh, infants of diabetic mother. Uh, any updates or any changes in their screening? I mean, the risk factors for diabetes has not screened, but I mean, has not changed, but we have, uh, I mean, this two concepts. One is the antenatal expressing. Once you know that the mother is diabetic, we know, I mean, one of the most important things we want is to support exclusive breastfeeding. And uh, we can start antenatal expressing. So I would request all the obstetric colleagues, the antenatal clinic nurses, everyone to be familiar with that. Uh, not all, all your centers may have lactation consultant support as we have. We are lucky to have a good team, but I would encourage all of you to read more about it. And uh, I mean, there are leaflets available and I'll share a video on that shortly as well on my channel. So it's a very important concept. The other point is about oral sucrose, I mean, uh, oral dextrose gel, which is, uh, I mean, available in many of the centers. We want to treat it in a way that we don't separate the mother and the baby as far as we can. Uh, apart from that, I mean, the risk factors uh, stay the same. I mean, there is no change. Uh, in front of diabetic mother still needs screening. The duration of screening depends on the condition you're treating. I mean, if the baby is premature, or growth restricted, we screen them for a longer time. If it is a large for gestational age baby without any other risk factor, 
two consecutive readings, which are normal, even 12 to 24 hours, we can stop. Infant of diabetic mother, we screen them till 24 hours. And we need a normal uh, blood sugar level when we stop it. If it is borderline, we continue uh, screening. But the more important point is support to the feeding. I mean, irrespective of what you're doing, we should make sure that there is continuity. It's not blindly doing something for the sake of doing it, but understanding why you are doing it. I mean, suppose a baby, the mother is not supported with the feeding and you're just giving one or two support feeds uh, during the period, but she has still not established feeds when you stop the sugar monitoring. That's not adequate because the damage to the brain can still happen after that. I've uh, seen some cases coming back where the support to the mother was not adequate they fulfilled their role in screening and they've documented the mother was discharged at 24 hours, but the baby comes back with the brain injury or face seizures. It's, um, hypoglycemic brain injury is very serious because it's permanent. 50% uh, risk of an abnormal neurological outcome if the baby is present. So it's simple. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. To this, Dr. Sridhar, if the mother is not, sorry, I asked this question to me. Yeah, if, if the mother is not diabetic, but sometimes they're seeing large for gestational age babies, despite no diagnosis of GDM. Um, so in those babies also, do you do um, screening just like you would for diabetic mothers or babies or diabetic mothers or... Actually, in any population-based uh, screening approach, you do have a little bit of... Uh ring on the side of caution. So the large for gestational age babies, if, I mean, we have many parents from uh, say Scandinavian countries who are normally very tall. So the tall parents are expected to have large babies and the population charts, the LGA is defined as more than the 95th centile. So most of their babies would be more than the 95th centile. So in such cases, you can individualize if there is no gestational diabetes, if the family is a tall one and the baby looks healthy otherwise. As I said, a couple of normal readings is enough. If the parents refuse in these cases, I do take a refusal consent, but I don't push them because you know that the risk is not really high. But where the risk is really high, you have to push them even if they refuse the consent because not all parents would want uh, screening, uh, I mean, pricking their baby, but we have to explain to them the long-term impact of not picking up hypoglycemia because they cannot utilize alternative fuels. Questions, please. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, lost your voice for a second. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me, Dr. Sridhar? Yes. Okay. I, something is wrong with my mic. Um, so if anybody has any other questions, please post them in the chat box or unmute yourself to ask Dr. Sridhar directly. Um, I have another question about the GBS issue. So we get a lot of pregnant women who are positive or who have not been tested yet, but they don't like the idea of getting antibiotics in labor. So, you know, a lot of women nowadays are quite anti-antibiotics, rightly so, but they don't want even that prophylactic dose. So in that case, if the mother is not tested or GBS positive, but refuses antibiotics or reaches too late to get antibiotics, then what is, I just want to know what is the current protocol for the babies, if they are term babies? I mean, it's, it's a difficult issue if they didn't have any previous affected child. And obviously in UK, for example, the RCOG guidelines, they don't screen routinely. Here you have screened and you have a positive mother. So that makes it a tricky issue. But uh, obviously the current American Academy guidelines are very conservative in terms of uh, blood tests or screening. All that we require is a baby will stay in hospital for minimum 48 hours if not adequate antibiotic cover. And you do vital signs a little more frequently, which is safer. So uh, from my point of view, I mean, personally, you can take the refusal and at the same time explain to them that you're not missing out much because of this. If the baby is symptomatic, they would get treated anyway. And if the baby is premature, you approach it differently in the situation because you have a positive GBS. But in a term baby, without antibiotic cover also, uh, your score doesn't go up unless there are other risk factors. So monitoring the baby is all that is needed. So you can tell them you would need to stay in the hospital for 48 hours if you don't get adequate prophylaxis and uh, agree to that, that's all. If they refuse that and they still want to go home early, then tough luck. But in this 48 hours, are any tests or sepsis being done for the baby? If the baby, baby is asymptomatic, that's what I said previously, before 2010 guidelines, it was quite aggressive. I mean, even lumbar puncture was done fairly frequently. 
But after 2010, they went the way I would have preferred them to go. And luckily, I mean, American Academy has changed a lot. I mean, even the current jaundice guidelines is fairly favorable to the families and less intervention is encouraged. So that's, in my view, the best way to go about it. And uh, I mean, in terms of uh, while we are on this uh, general topic, I mean, while we are waiting for a question, I would request everyone not to miss or not to underestimate the importance of uh, delayed cot lamping. I know this is one of my favorite topics, which is very easily done. And the point I would like to make here is that don't think you're doing anything extra. You are doing what is supposed to be done because the blood which is in the placental part of the, that is a, the fetal blood actually, it doesn't belong to the mother. It doesn't belong to the placenta. The placenta is an extension of the fetus. And because the lung is not oxygenated, lung is not functioning, the blood that's supposed to be going into the lung is going into the placenta to do the lungs function. So it's a baby's own blood. And remember that this blood has all the antibodies. We keep praising the antibody transfer that happens, the protective factors, the stem cells, all these factors that come from the mother, 20% of that remains in that blood. So don't think twice about delayed cord clamping. Many times obstetricians are worried about uh, the baby not crying soon after birth. You don't need the baby to cry. You need to make sure that the cord pulsation is there. If it is above 100, you don't need to hesitate. And actually there are studies which are going on to bring the resuscitation to the mother's side so we can expand the lungs even by IPPV before the clamp, uh, clamping happens. But one important request to everyone is to keep the OR temperatures as per the NRP, the labor room and the OR temperatures as per the NRP requirement, at least one or two degrees within that range. I know uh, culturally we are used to very cold freezing environments here indoor, we are not green. But at the same time, we should try our best to protect the babies. The skin-to-skin -skin care, which is part of the BFHA, delayed cot clamping, all these needs the OR temperature to be appropriate. So as an advocate for babies, we request you that you tolerate the little heat for a period of time to help the babies do better. And don't think delayed cot clamping is an option. It's a compulsory thing. If you're not doing it, you're actually doing a disfavor to your patient because the baby is an extension of their own patient. Also, um, so yeah, I was going to ask you another question uh, since I'm still waiting for anybody else to ask. Uh, so some patients have asked me that their previous baby had jaundice after birth and they want to know if there's anything they can do antenatally or after birth to reduce the chances of that. So is there any such uh, thing that can be done? It's a good question. I mean, obviously there are family factors that affect the jaundice. For example, the liver maturation tends to follow a pattern, the blood group related risk factors. And I pointed out what the risk factors are. Uh, I have some uh, detailed videos on the current American Academy updates as well and uh, approach to jaundice management. But expressing breast milk antenatally can be done in almost all the mothers. Of course, if you are multigravida and you have breastfed before, the milk comes in in most of the cases anyway. So we need to focus on such mothers where the, uh, for example, the previous baby had jaundice, the mother has gestational diabetes, it's a primary gravida, or she had difficulty breastfeeding her first baby and she had to mix feed. These are the mothers we target for the antenatal expressing. Anyone can start doing it, to be honest. And milk doesn't flow. I mean, you get the colostrum, but you're uh, starting the process. So you're gaining the initial two days that the baby lacks by getting this. So I think uh, if we all adapt that practice, it's safe. I mean, it doesn't uh, stimulate the oxytocin uh, to an extent to induce labor. And that's why we're saying 36 body. weeks. Yeah. Okay. So that would help in preventing jaundice in the newborn. Yes, second. early establishment of lactation helps too. questions Dr. Sridhar everybody is just thanking you and commenting that it was an excellent lecture uh, somebody has liked the part on the hip development and um, there is a comment that it was uh, always like a GP level base so very very useful for people practically you know uh, on on the field so that is um, so, I have no questions for you so I think there's uh, 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 a link to the YouTube Dr. Sridhar, channel, yes okay? Sorry, I mean, has a link to the YouTube channel been shared? Yes, or? Uh, two, three times I have posted that. Uh, I and Dr. encourage Ittihad... you to go through it. Most of what we discussed are available as two to three minute videos and it's organized as playlists. And uh, parents, I mean, uh, there are playlists for parents, playlists for breastfeeding. And it's important also that where a mother is not fully successful with the breastfeeding, they need to know how to do the alternative options. So 
there are playlists for that as well. So uh, I, I would request you to go through it as possible. And I mean, most of the topics that we covered today are in separate videos as well. So if you want to keep brief revisions, it's fine as well. So you can copy it, you can go on it right now. I mean, while Dr. Ittehaj has a question. Uh, sorry for asking many questions, but it's so interesting, doctor. <laughs> so uh, uh, regarding taking care of mothers who have preterm babies, like uh, medication wise, we know that there is breastfeeding uh, medication which is safe during breastfeeding. But my question, anything specifically regarding the preterm babies? Once the mother, once a baby has delivered preterm, you mean? Yeah, for example, the mother, uh, diabetic or hypertensive, she has preterm delivery, so she has premature baby. If me as a physician taking care of the mother, any special precautions shall I do? Yes, I mean, a very important question and thank you for asking that. I mean, there are two things here. One is about the medication and the other one is about the emotional turmoil that this mother is going through because it's not an easy phase at all. And I mean, in this culture, the fathers often want us to give less information to the mother. I always speak to the father and explain to them why actually we shouldn't keep the mother in the dark because they are an equal partner and they need to. And here actually the women are quite uh, knowledgeable and they're educated as well. So they ask questions. But from the obstetrician point of view, looking for signs of postnatal depression uh, because it's often underrated. We have counseling support. And I think JCI uh, is one of the requirements now that we have antenatal uh, postnatal support for the mothers. You have a checklist, but we shouldn't base it on checklist. The preterm baby in the NICU is a risk factor for postnatal depression. Nutrition of the mother is important. Adequate rest for the mother is important. And medication-wise, of course, I mean, uh, please feel free to contact the neonatologist and bother us anytime. Uh, I hope that okay. answers your question. And thank you for asking questions. Please don't, don't feel bad about asking. It's the best thing you can do. Uh, actually, doctor, we are uh, I'm, uh, internal, from internal medicine department, not a gynecologist. So we don't have contact with neonatology. So if you can refer me to any, for example, list or anything regarding preterm babies, uh, that medication. It's not specific for preterm babies, but uh, I mean, in terms of antibiotic choice, in terms of uh, medication choice, for example, antidepressants, where, uh, I mean, there are medications like SSRIs, for example, which should be avoided. And there are certain medications which can be given with caution. And if you're treating the uh, hyperthyroidism, for example, you have certain medications you use during pregnancy, prefer to the others. Again, the use of uh, oral anti-diabetics during pregnancy. So most of the issues happen during pregnancy. Breastfeeding as such is not a huge risk and premature babies don't differ from term babies uh, unless the medication effect is very high. Uh, so, I mean, the best thing is uh, for you to, uh, I mean, there is a, textbook uh, for lactation related. And so if you refer to the lactation consultant or ask the mother to discuss with the lactation consultant before you actually prescribe, uh, that would be adequate. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you very much, thank you. There's a question, uh, somebody is asking about colostrum for diabetic babies and how early to start expressing. I think they mean antenatally. Yes, antenatal expressing at the earliest after 36 weeks. And um, we have to tell the mothers it's only hand expressing. They don't use a pump before the delivery. And uh, they can learn from their lactation consultant. Sometimes antenatal problems, uh, I mean, the nipple related problems may get better with this as well. Uh, they will need to store. Initially, they may get just 0.5 to 1 ml. And uh, I mean, up to three expressions can be stored together. You can keep it in the fridge and combine them and freeze them. So you don't need to store every 0.5 ml separately in a syringe. So you can uh, go through the guidelines. I mean, I have shared it in the MH group recently and uh, maybe Dr. Neha can post it for everyone who's attending this session. This is from uh, uh, Breastfeeding Society and uh, obviously uh, the guidelines can be shared. How much to give? Obviously, uh, the newborn baby's stomach is small and it's a very interesting point. I mean, uh, in terms of I'll make it here because we still have five more minutes. Uh, in terms of the baby's feeding pattern, nature has evolved in a way the breastfeeding doesn't go from zero to 60 in one day, the volume per feed. But when we are giving the formula milk or when we are giving uh, additional support, we expect to give uh, 30 ml on the first day, 60 ml on the second day. So breast milk actually only increases say five to 10 ml on the first day and the baby starts getting 20, 30 ml by three to four days. 
and if a mother is expressing like 25 30 ml by third day we are very surprised because it's a good volume and that's what the baby is going to get when they feed and there is a reason for this uh, it's related to epigenetics it's related to pre-programming so if you give too much too early the epigenetic expressions change and it may lead to higher risk of future problems like obesity diabetes and so on the other important problem the immediate effect is that the lactase enzyme is not well developed in the newborn and once the milk uh, lactose gets exposed there is upgradation of this enzyme level up regulation happens and over the first week the enzyme gradually increases so the load that the baby is exposed to should be gradually increased so even if you are giving top up feeds for any reason don't give the prescribed volume i mean uh, we are aiming to give fluid balance of 60 ml per kilo per day on day 1 by tradition when the baby gets admitted to the nicu but when baby is on feed you don't necessarily need that unless the baby is hypoglycemic so the hypoglycemic babies are different but other babies you don't need to top up a big volume just top up enough to keep the baby uh, comfortable and encourage the breast milk expression and uh, many nurses have made an observation interesting observation i think it was rosa in our team who made that she said if the baby is hypoglycemic we give formula and then these babies get nappy rash per day to 3 so remember that when lactase enzyme is deficient the lactose doesn't get digested well you get acidic stools so you get uh, more of nappy rash in the early stages and these uh, factors also aggravate the baby's colic coming on early uh, so many factors i mean the mother infant interaction the cues the one of the most important things that the lactation consultant stresses on is the cue based feeding but only nature can teach us what the actual cue based response is because if you are over stressing on uh, responding to the cues quickly we may be overdoing it and breastfed babies can be overfed as well in the multi gravida for example who has enough milk you may start overfeeding the breastfed baby and the same problems can happen in a breastfeeding baby the baby cries because of discomfort we end up feeding them again and it, uh, it's a vicious cycle and reflex also sets in as a complex so it's a uh, close interaction of these factors so allow nature to progress don't intervene too much support the mother as needed and don't worry too much about how much you are giving as long as the baby is physiologically stable and the weight monitoring as well is very important some weight loss is normal and after that the weight gain should progress but at a normal range i mean that's why we should start discussing with the families about percentile based growth patterns teach them that each family doesn't grow the same way any mother who ends up with formula feeding their baby they see the tin and they say baby has to get 240 ml by 3 months none of your babies will take 240 ml in 3 months the formula company wants to sell more that's where they're writing to overfeed and remember that after the baby starts weaning you should reduce the milk intake so all these healthy practices should be encouraged and uh, obstetricians there is uh, no harm in knowing more about the baby care as well because all of us are advocates for the family health in the long term i think there is a lag with your mic working dr neha so before you speak you turn it on and then speak after a few seconds can't hear you yeah now it's okay i don't know what is wrong i will have it like it. today so um, that that was very informative and i agree that you know the obstetricians we need to be aware because we are the ones who start talking to them in the antenatal period and and those are the you know uh, things that carry on after birth um so i always encourage my patients to start reading about breastfeeding even when they are pregnant so that you know it helps them prepare as well um any other questions if anybody has we have a couple of minutes more otherwise i'll just let uh, dr sridhar end uh, with whatever last minute tips and uh, he wants to give us and obviously there's everything else is on his youtube channel and it's been posted in the chat box so please go and have a look at those play playlists i'm sure it will be very useful dr sridhar i think it has been an amazing audience i mean uh, 130 people early morning is very good and thanks to your uh, cme accreditation which uh, adds value to everyone who is listening and i requested the team to share this so this will go on youtube as well uh, shortly on my channel so once it is shared uh, please feel free to share it with other colleagues who couldn't attend the session and again i congratulate you and your team it leads a lot of work people don't know how much work you're doing in the background because uh, for me as a presenter for one presentation you have um, 15 20 uh, 
communications to co co correspond and you're doing this week in and week out and commendable job so well done and please keep doing it the whole team so tahira anit who are working constantly behind the screen cherry munthar jihan who are also working from the marketing side it support so it's a good team and uh, thank you so much our faculty because if you don't agree to speak we have nothing to present <laughs> so <laughs> Thank you so much. And thank you very much, everybody, for attending and taking our time. Um, and um, yeah, we will see you again next week with another interesting topic. See you. Thank, thank you, you so everyone. much, everyone. Good luck. For the certificates, I just want to again reiterate that now we are not the ones issuing the certificates. DOH is issuing these certificates, but we will approve your participation. So within two months of the session, you must go to the DOH website through TAM and apply for the uh, CME. And then we will approve it as soon as possible. You will then get an SMS and an email from DOH, and then you can download your certificate from there. Uh, for people who are not working in Abu Dhabi, please email to us at Academic Affairs, and we will send you a certificate which will work for you outside of Abu Dhabi. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, and thank you, Dr. Sridhar once again. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nikhil.